rest of everyone's time. So just by way of introduction, our speaker today is Chef John Vito. John is a restaurateur. He also um, has been a dialysis patient and he is a kidney transplant recipient. And he is the publisher of the, of the cookbook, Cooking for Your Kidneys. Um, so he truly understands the challenges of the renal diet and he, his goal is to make food taste delicious while also working in some food science in, into the renal diet and really helping patients. He also is serving on our advisory board out in the Rochester area. He has spoken for the Council on Renal Nutrition both in the Rochester area and the Pittsburgh area. So we are delighted that he has agreed to do these monthly sessions with us. We're going to do sessions one month for patients and then one month for renal dietitians. But of course, we're going to open it up um, for anyone that wants to participate. So I would ask that everyone mute their lines while John is speaking. He's going to break along the way and ask for questions. And of course, you can also submit your questions through the chat function and we'll make sure that they get delivered to, to John. But without further ado, I really want to turn it over to John at this point. He has a, a great interactive program um, scheduled for you. And so we're just delighted that everyone could participate. And, and John, thank you. I'm going to ask you to take it away now. Um, my uh, camera guy may try to switch us back and forth between the overhead and my per and the view of me. We've had a little difficulty, um, but we are going to try. So if we don't get the overhead on occasion, but I'll try to show things in the camera uh, somehow, at least uh, to point it out. And I'll try to also explain it as well. So um, that's step one. Now that's where I am. Um, if Carol will allow me to um, pat myself on the back, I just wanted to add one more accolade. Absolutely. I was the... Um, um, in March, uh, I won the, well, I was one of 10 winners for the Patient uh, Innovation Award from Kidney X, which was a national award, uh, was going to be presented in New Orleans, so if any of the renal RDs were heading down there for their continued learning, I was going to be there as well. So I always wanted to plug myself, if that's okay. okay. So, and, and more importantly, I wanted to say that because I always start out when I speak to renal dietitians by just pointing out the irony that you're listening to me for some reason about food and nutrition when I spent most of my time listening to you uh, because you guys taught me so much while I was on dialysis. That's the first time I had an opportunity to actually interact with a, uh, an RD and it was really helpful and I still do it and I still work with them because they helped me so much. So hopefully you'll, I can present some information that's not necessarily in the RD world, but it's the food science world. And I think it can be some, be very helpful. So as an overview, we're going to talk a lot about chickens. We're going to do something with uh, greens and beans, and we're going to talk about hummus. Uh, I noticed after I, I did all this, it's kind of a protein uh, section, and uh, but there's a lot of interesting things in, that I have questions about, and maybe somebody will have some answers to. So anyway, let's get started. Um, the first thing I'm going to point out uh, is about chicken, and this is kind of an actionable item, I think, for patients. Um, I, I believe you all know, or anybody who's a renal dietitian already knows that those pre-cooked chickens we buy in the store are just loaded with sodium and are not the best items for us to use at all because of that. In addition, there's a lot of other things. They don't use the best chickens when they do that. Uh, and the same thing goes when you buy chicken in, uh, as whole or in parts. What we end up getting is um, different types. You can buy a variety. And the, the, the issues are going to be how they process the chicken to cool it down. So the one, one is the uh, standard way to do it is a water bath. They run it through and that loses a ton of flavor. Uh, and in addition, it also absorbs water and it's not just water, but there's a chemical bath that helps cool it down. And that chemical gets absorbed too. Usually chlorine, believe it or not, and some, maybe even some sodium. Um, and then in addition, because of the loss of flavors, what they do is then they add water. And it's not water, it's either claimed as chicken stock, but it's really a huge amount of sodium and phosphorus along with that water. So you can tell when you look at chicken, it'll say retained water, less than 2% if you're lucky, and it'll say water added, chicken stock added, up to 15 or 16%. That's always going to be the cheaper variety because you're paying less for meat and protein than you are for chemicals. And we know that those are 
inorganic, so they're absorbing 100%. So it's important to try to find the limit, uh, the smallest amount of retained water and zero water added. Better yet, if you can find them, we have something called uh, air chill. And I don't know if we're going to be able to switch over on the cameras, but we'll give it a shot. But an air chill chicken just means it doesn't go through. Yeah, well, John and I know we're, that's the bad <laughs> sign. <laughs> Hopefully you can hear me and I'll keep talking while we switch it back. But in this air, this is a uh, chicken. And if I can get it right there, you probably won't be able to see it. But it says air chilled on the other side of my finger. And what that means is it doesn't go through any of the water baths and they don't inject it with any sodium solutions or water. It's going to be more expensive. This is organic. Um, I know that our local, at least in the upstate New York area and the city, they have a local producer. I think it's Bell and Ward, but they will package it under their own name. And this one is a Wegmans brand, but I saw the box. I talked to the butchers. They said, yeah, it comes right from this Bell and something. And I, I apologize. I don't have the exact name, but it wouldn't matter. You wouldn't see it on the label. So that's the important part about buying chicken. And I've talked about that a lot in different places. And I really hope that that's like what I said as a, I think that's the business term, an actionable item. So when you're talking to patients, you can say, look, chicken has, we know what it has in it as far as the potassium and the sodium, I'm sorry, phosphorus and sodium, but then there's all that hidden stuff. And so they can just read the packages. So here's another issue. Uh, cooking your own chicken is often very difficult because it takes a long time, a whole chicken can be really a pain. Uh, so I've always done something called a spatchcock chicken. And what that means is that it's kind of, it's basically this, it's like a butterfly chicken. And there's the name, if you can see it, it's a little bit weird. Um, but what it means is that it's gonna cook really fast. So the way we're gonna, now here's where we're gonna do a little cooking. Okay. So we're, I'm just opening this up fully. And these chickens, sorry, when I go in and out, it just means I'm going from the stove over here or maybe throwing something out. Um, by, by thinning out this chicken, what we're doing is letting it, uh, let the heat catch more area. It's not as thick, so it doesn't have to penetrate so far, and it'll cook faster. I did a four pound chicken earlier. It took about 45 minutes, full chicken, and I'll show it to you in a few minutes. But, but anyway, so because it's not, you know, we were doing a cooking show, not just a, you know, me telling you about food science, we're actually going to cook some of these. And so what I've got here is this, this chicken. This is a small one. It's about 2.9 pounds. And it's all opened up for me, which is perfect. And from here, I'm just going to add some, some ingredients. Um, I'm going to see if I can get that in the picture somewhere. But maybe not. You know, I'm going to add some salt and some pepper, some oil. But more importantly, I'm going to use a cast iron skillet. And what I'm going to do with that to add flavor. Now, remember, the whole reason they do all of those other chemical things is to add flavor to the chicken because it lost flavor. And so what we're going to try to do is add flavor in addition to the lack of chemicals. Um, so in this case, we also know that when we cook chicken, we get a lot of fat, no matter how good it is. And sometimes then that chicken kind of sits in that fat. And that's another thing. Hey, John. That was my camera guy. I just wanted to say how great that was. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to take and put a layer of thick flavorings on the bottom of that pan before we throw it in the oven. And that's going to help enhance flavors. And it's going to help to keep the bottom of the chicken from actually cooking too much in that fat. Um, so we want them nice and thick, good thick pieces to get them up there. You don't need much. In these cases, I usually use about one whole onion, and you can see the thickness there maybe, somewhere if we get it over the right camera uh, angle. And I'm also gonna use a lemon. Now, lemon of course is a great add-on for all of our food. I talk about these things a lot when I use, um, when I cook with other items. Sorry, I'm just trying to get this peeled off, which I should have done earlier. Please know that I will clean my hands properly appropriately and re-glove when necessary. Um, so anyway, so that's the chicken idea. Now, the other part of this is using a very high heat. So normally you might think, oh, let's put my chicken in like a turkey. I use about 350 degrees, but then we use about 450. 
The two things that does is it provides that rotisserie outside exterior, which is that crispy shell on the chicken, and it also will make it cook faster. And again, because I'm going to use this whole lemon, we're not worried about cross contamination. And of course, we're not going to really use this anyway. So we have that, and I have my little garbage bowl over there. Um, so from here, we're just going to use some salt and some pepper and some olive oil. And again, I'm going to clean all these. I'm going to do both sides. And from here, pretty simple. We want to liberate, I mean, use the stuff that we can use. We can use pepper. So that's great. Um, we use a little bit of sodium, but not much. And I'm here, I'm using the really large pieces. Uh, again, just because you'll use less if you measure. And it's really, really simple, especially because you don't have to actually spatchcock the chicken. And what that means, and I'll explain that, is to cut it in half. And what you do is you end up just cutting out the backbone that would connect these two pieces. And you remove that, and that's it. So from there, we're just going to set it in our pan. And you can see that normally this would be flipped under like this. And they pull them right out for you. And that's it. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put that right in my oven because I've got one set up. I expect that it will not cook by the time we're done, but I have one done anyway. Um, so that's what we do for a chicken. And again, the reason I bring this up, and I, I'll go over it, the, the focus is how do we take a, something we would normally eat and make it better. And we're gonna make it better by adding flavor. We're gonna make it better by getting that crisp outside, which is what they call the Maillard reaction. So we get a crisp outer shell. And if we get lucky, you know, we're gonna end up with something like this. Okay, so this is what I cooked earlier. You can see that it's a little bit elevated. If you can, I'm not sure you can, but you can, I don't know what happened to the camera there, but anyway. Um, and we got a little bit of the browning. The browning on the chicken is really important because that adds that, what I call the Maillard reaction, which I've done a quick video about, and that enhances flavor. It's its own separate flavor. Uh, it's the brown parts on bread. It's the brown parts on meat, anything like that. You know, if you've ever had a grilled romaine salad, part of the reason it's so good is because they are caramelizing that outside, which is an entirely new flavor option. Um, so again, we're adding flavor without adding anything bad for dialysis patients. Um, I'm looking at my notes, make sure I caught everything on there. So for, for the chicken, I, I do tons of things with this. I'm going to take this chicken and I will, I might just take all the meat off and I'll use it for a, in a rice dish. I'll use it as, just as you would any other uh, roasted chicken that you buy in the store. But I also make my own chicken stock. So I'm going to take all the bones out. I mean, unless I'm eating it on my, I'm not going to take the whole bone and then my plate and then put it in the stock. But sometimes I'll take all the meat off and I make my own stock. And I know I'm talking fast, but um, I'll try to slow down. But the stock is so important because we can use it in so many dishes, especially now that we can, we're adding, uh, you know, whether it's veggie stock or meat stock, we, we seem to have added more to our diet with the new rules. Um, so I like to use the veggie stock for everything, including things like cooking beans, unless I'm, you know, you're, you're doing it for a vegetarian, because it adds so much flavor. And if you made it yourself, you know what you're adding. And it's not going to add a ton of sodium or phosphates, either, uh, you know, or inorganic phosphates. Um, so I do that. And, you know, chicken stock is really simple. You just take your bones, you take some of the meat that's on there, some veggies, you throw it in a pot and let it cook down. And that's, and that's all you have to do. So I just wanted to bring up the chicken as a protein for those meat eaters, especially dialysis patients who need it and how to help get rid of some of those, um, get rid of, watch out for some of those obvious phosphorus items in there, especially the water added. So, and the, the, the whole game here is to buy air chilled chicken if you can find it. So that is our chicken. Does anybody have any questions on that before we kind of move on to another item? What do you think, Carol? If you do have questions, you can unmute yourself and ask a question, or you can submit it through the chat function. All right. So I don't see anything coming in over chat. So okay. That's one I mean, more. It's just chicken. It seems pretty obvious. Um, 
So the next thing we're going to do is I'm going to take some of that chicken stock that I thought I made, but I didn't, you know, I had, that I had made earlier. And I'm going to make something, um, uh, it's something called greens and beans, but I'm going to use something called rapi, rapini, uh, broccoli rob. Maybe you've heard of this. Um, here's the basic, what it looks like. And I don't know, we'll see if we get the different camera angle. But it's something in the cabbage family. It, so it, we say that it's, um, we say that it's, broccoli, but it's really rapi. Uh, it's because these little flowering parts might look like broccoli, uh, but they're not. Uh, and it's really good for you. It's very healthy. It's certainly going to have some uh, potassium and phosphorus in there, but not a lot. And that's one of the reasons I like it. And it's in the cabbage family, so you'll know um, how that works. We're going to use um, some beans. We're going to talk about that. And we're going to add um, some noodles. But the first thing we're going to do is just kind of cut this up and cook it. Broccoli rob, rapini, whatever we want to call it, is very tough and it's got, it's going to have these stock ends to it. A lot, and they're going to be tough and very fibrous. So we know for some people that's going to be great and for others, maybe not so much, you know, depending on the patients. Um, so I like to eat those. I'll take the fiber, um, but I really just want to cut this up a little bit and I want to rough chop it because I don't want it too small and too big. Some people will discard all that. I won't. You know, I'll use it. And I'm going to take this, and I'm going to throw it right into a boiling pot of water. And it's going to cook. It's going to take a little bit. And while we're doing that, we'll probably cook some other. Well, we're going to add the, the sauce to that, I think. Again, we may jump around. Now, <clears throat> the flavors with these are really simple. It's green, it's a bitter green. You've probably had other bitter greens. So what we're trying to do is add a, some kind of strong flavors that are gonna help get rid of that bitterness. And in this case, we're gonna use garlic and we're gonna use beans and we're gonna use a lot of, and some oil um, and a few others. But that's really, so you're, you're balancing these flavors. You're balancing the strong bitter flavor. And I know garlic can be bitter, uh, but the beans won't be so that the softer flavor in there. Um, and, and that's part of this cooking idea is balance. And, and, and again, it's all about really trying to exclude flavor for patients so we can avoid the chemicals that they buy in food or the sodium that we would normally add. Um, and, and that's part of the process, bringing up some strong flavors without the bad stuff. So we're going to do beans. Now, while this cooks, uh, Here's my uh, beans. I think we all know this. I mean, I'm not going to tell you anything you don't know here, um, but we know canned beans are really high in sodium. And I think on a, on a standard canned bean, they're 15%. Um, probably have one up here too somewhere. You know, your standard 15 ounce canned bean, uh, it's 15% per serving. Serving is a half a cup, not a lot. Reduced sodium cans, you find they're going to be about 5%. Uh, but that's still only a half a cup. That's not a ton. Although it's really simple, and I understand it, obviously we just buy the reduced sodium. But with all of the new focus on Instapots, I thought it was important to bring that up because it's, it's, it takes some time. I don't know if patients will do it, but you can cook your own beans in an Instapot very quickly. You know, you follow the instructions. You soak them overnight to pull off some of that. Uh, outer shell and that's some of that other flavoring that's not so good and bitter. Cook them in the Instant Pot maybe 45, 50 minutes. And the nice thing here is you don't have to add the sodium. You don't have to add any, you're not going to add any inorganic phosphates. Uh, and we can add other flavors. So the issue is all of a sudden we can start throwing carrots and garlic into these Instant Pots and create beans with wonderful flavor and no sodium and really get it. And that's because we can eat beans now according to the new diets. Now, you tell me if, the, I mean, I don't know if everybody's on board with that yet. I don't know if it's a industry standard. I do know some doctors who weren't real happy, um, but we know that some of the doctors don't always know the nutritional aspect parts of that. If anybody has a thought on that or if, they're, if it is um, widespread and considered the new policy, you know, pushing plant-based when they can, I, I'd love to hear that because I only talked to three or four different nutritions, uh, 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 dietitians. That was my mistake, sorry. Dietitians, um, and they're really they're really big into plant based. So that's my feedback from them. But if anybody has a thought on that, I'm happy to listen to it. I'm just going to grab some water. 
Um, and I, excuse me, I have some other issues with that too. Wonder, it's not issues, they're just you know, curiosity issues. Um, so we're gonna make this dish, it's greens. We have our beans. We're gonna add a little chicken stock, but you could certainly use veggie, uh, veggie stock for people who wanna stick with plant-based. Lots of garlic, which I'm gonna cut up in a few minutes. <coughs> excuse me, I'm so sorry. But we also, we're gonna add noodles. So a little pasta. And I think it's because in my mind, I think about a complete protein. And if we're pushing a lot of plant-based, and I know this doesn't happen too much in the standard American diet, but if we're gonna be, if you're gonna find people that are really interested in that, we could add, um, you know, you add rice to your beans and it really comes close to a complete protein. We get the right amounts of all the essentials. Uh, so I like to do that, at least point it out. So I've done that. Um, but just as interesting, in my opinion, is um, the issue about pasta. And you may not know this. You may, maybe I'm telling you things you already know. But it's pretty well researched at this point, And I think it's becoming more commonplace. But by adding pasta, we obviously I add carbohydrates. And for some patients, that's a problem. But there's been studies done, and they've repeated them, and they're being reviewed, and everybody seems to know this because it's a resistant starch. But if you cook pasta and eat it that night, you will absorb 100% of the carbohydrates. If you eat pasta, which they did this weird test. I don't, you know, they don't, I don't know why they did this. They must have been looking for something. But if they took that same pasta and they refrigerated it overnight and had people eat it cold, they used the same patients. You know, it was a I don't want to say it was a good study, but I, just from what we can tell, what I can tell. Um, so they ate the pasta, fresh, 100% of the carbohydrates after a blood, uh, blood, blood drop, and saw their sugar levels spike to, to a certain level. They put the pasta in the refrigerator overnight, had to meet it the same the next day, and the spike was about 7% less. So cold pasta wasn't... Uh, absorbing, or it wasn't turning it into the carbohydrates, into the sugars, et cetera. And you know more about that than I do. But what they also did is they reheated the pasta. And when they reheated it, they found that an additional 50% reduction in the starches that the body was using. So in other words, it started to act like fiber in the body. So for patients who were diabetic, if there was a pasta, you know, if they worry about pasta, um, it might be helpful. Or for anybody who's trying to maybe not, you know, lose a few pounds, you know, that might also be an answer. So I've, I've highlighted that in my book in the recipe, all the, um, or the, the, one of the recipes in my book, all the uh, research is cited, the information is there, um, and I'm just pulling their information and applying it to cooking and to kidney disease. So the idea that we have this dish with these, these greens that are really good for us, um, beans, if we've cooked them ourselves without all that uh, extra sodium, uh, the reduced amount of absorption of the phosphorus from the beans that we now get to count. Um, lots of garlic and onion, which we're going to add. Uh, we have a pretty good dish, and it can be either a soup, or it can be uh, a thinner version, um, like just a pile of greens and beans, uh, or, you know, you can lighten it up as I do with the, with the chicken stock in this case. Um, I'm just going to pull this out of the way, and I'm going to grab my pot so we can finish cooking the onions and garlic for this particular one. So bear with me as I just step out, step back in again. How are we doing on time? Oh, we're doing great. We're doing great. So I'm going to use just my own garlic. I'm going to heat up my pan. Now, most chefs will tell you this. Um, not everybody will follow through with it. You should always heat your pan first, then you should add your olive oil or your fat, whatever you're using, in this case olive oil, because it's very good for, better for patients. And then you should heat it. Never add your oil to a cold pan. Uh, it's just gonna cause some problems for the, for the cooking process. Now, for garlic, I don't know how pe people feel about garlic. Some people may say, oh, I'm not a big fan, or it can be too strong. Um, there are some issues that you can work on. For instance, if I just took this garlic peel right here and peeled off the outer skin in a very quick fashion, which I'm not doing, so I'll do my standard little tap. Um, and you threw this whole peel, see if I can get it in there, in there you're not going to get a ton of flavor. You're going to get a mild flavor. 
So it's going to be very, very light, um, which is good. And sometimes you want that. The more you break it down, the more you chop it up, you're going to get more flavor pulled out of that garlic. That's just a cooking tip. I like to throw those in in case anybody's doing that. Now, I know I touched my little squeeze bottle, so I'm just going to change that over there. All right, so my pan's pretty warm or warm enough. And I'm just going to add that. And you can see sometimes it's moving around and it'll shimmer a little bit as it heats, but that happens right away when it's warm enough. You don't need much. Um, these recipes I can put online if people are interested so they can access them and with the exact amounts. Now for this particular one, I'm going to use, I'm just going to crush this garlic up a little fast, a little more so I can get more flavor out of it. Again, trying to use less sodium, trying to use less processed food ingredients and still you know, have some flavor in our food so we're not so inclined to grab that salt. I like to talk, when I cook garlic, again, we're going to get some, some cooking ideas here. When I cook garlic, I like to use a pretty medium heat, and I don't like to walk away. Um, the reason is I think garlic has, has a very quick process to go bad. So in other words, you put it in right now, it's still cooking, and I can smell it. It's bitter. It's raw. Uh, if people like that, that's fantastic. Um, I don't, but that's okay. The next level is going to be where it cooks just enough. It's going to level out, and it's going to be a little sweet. It's not going to be quite brown yet. It's going to release some of that uh, the garlic flavor into the oil, because that's what we're doing. We're just infusing this oil with the flavor. And it's going to be there for less than a minute, and then it's going to start to turn brown, and it's going to start to be overcooked. And once you overcook garlic, which you all know, the whole dish is ruined. You have to start over completely. Uh, you can't do anything else with that, okay? So I like to have something handy. The next thing that I'm going to put in there that'll lower the temperature, slow down the cooking of the garlic. In this case, I'm going to throw these beans in. And again, I can just smell it. It's just getting there. It's still a little intense. It's still got that raw flavor. So it's just, it's, and I hate it. You know, most people will do this again. If you like garlic on the on the well done side, that's fine. If you like it on that raw bitter side, that's fine too. But for me, I like that that little perfect point when it hits. It's just about there. I can oh, I can smell the bitterness is gone. It's just getting a little brown. And now I'm just going to add some chicken stock that I made from those chickens that I cooked earlier, and that'll slow down that process. <clears throat> And then it'll boil off just a little bit. Okay. And again, these are simple dishes. As I, when I was a patient, I'm telling you, I, I would be hungry, but I, I wouldn't want to cook. I wouldn't have the energy to get off the couch, which is in the other room, just to come in here and even look for food. I know that's, it, it, it doesn't seem, I'm sure, I'm sure you've heard the stories over and over again if you work in dialysis, but I can't emphasize it enough how much of a drain that day is. And even if you reserve it to do other things, I know some patients walk after dialysis, some work, you know, we, we all have different experiences, but there is a significant drain in there. So I try to find something that's pretty easy. Again, here we're adding a lot of beans, but this is gonna be for a lot of people. Okay, so I'm gonna add some, a lot of pepper. Um, because there isn't much salt in this dish at all, I'm going to add just a little bit. And again, I'm using the large pieces, the uh, sea salt. Okay. And from there, and I know I'm walking away, but at least we got the right camera shot. I'm going to bring back the greens, which I was cooking on my other stove, uh, not my portable one here. So what you can see there is they are wilted just a little bit. Unlike other greens, they're not going to reduce that much. So that's a positive thing for us. We also know that when we cook veggies in water, this is just a standard nutrition issue, that we have a loss of nutrients in the water. Uh, this is one of the very few items I will cook in water. Everything else I will either roast or steam, even microwave, to try to, remain, to retain as many of the nutrients as possible. Um, 
You can see that this is bubbling up. It's just going to thin out a little bit and get a little thicker. You can also add some crushed red pepper in here. Um, I think that's a great choice, but it depends on your tolerance for heat. We certainly know that the capsaicin in the red pepper is going to help with, we don't know how much, but we know it helps with inflammation, right? And that's, I think from what I'm told, it is both a cause and an effect of uh, kidney issues. Um, normally I would drain this, but you know, we're doing fine. So what you can see, I mean, it's kind of a soupy mixture. Um, you can add fewer beans, you can add more of these, more greens, which I'm trying to do. Maybe I put too much beans in there to begin with. Um, but again, it, it's, you know, for several people, these bean, beans can be a little bitter, even after we cook them, especially those sauce, but they're really good for you. Um, often, if not always, for me, I'm going to add a little Parmesan, Parmigiano Reggiano. And I think you should, your ears should perk up and say, hey, come on, man, we, we can't add more cheese to this. But as I told people my, and many of my other little quick clips about Parmigiano Reggiano is if you buy the right stuff, if you buy it in a block format and you use a uh, microplane, you will actually be able to make very, very fine pieces which will distribute throughout the dish and give you that wonderful flavor without the weight of, uh, it'll be a small amount of weight. So you won't get that much, which is perfect. So you get all the flavor. If it's freshly grated, you'll get wonderful uh, a jump in flavor and you won't be adding too much um, cheese at all. You're just gonna get all the good flavors out of there. Okay, so I mean, this dish is maybe it looks a little heavy on beans, but if you're not using chicken stock and we need the protein for certain patients and you're not eating meat, that's great. Um, if we cook them ourselves, it gets rid of all the sodium, which is perfect. Um, again, the Instapot, perfect little device that so many people have, I think we should use for this kind of idea. It's not expensive at all. Um, so that is our second dish. And it looks pretty good. You can eat it with a little bread, you could use less stock, you could cook it down a little more, and it would be a, a lot thicker and use it as a, a plate, as a side dish, as a main dish, et cetera. All right, anybody have any thoughts about that or any questions? I kind of threw a lot at you. Wait a minute, I didn't finish, I'm so sorry. We talked about pasta, we talked about making it a, talked about making it a complete protein, my Lord, I'm so sorry. Normally, I eat it just like this, but recently I've started adding the pasta, and I really like it, both because it makes it a bigger, bulkier meal without anything in there. I, re I cooked this ahead of time, the pasta, put it in the fridge. Now I'm reheating it, so it's going to have a lower glycemic index. I think that's the right way we discuss that, um, which is really interesting. And I, and I encourage you, if you don't believe me, because nobody usually does it first, if they haven't read about it, so look it up and make sure that, uh, you know, my information is right. I'm very, com very confident about it because I've looked it up so many times and talked to others about it. Uh, so what we have here, a little dish. Let's use one of these. Let's get the final plating in. You know, it's a pretty good, and it's a very filling meal and leftovers. I mean, that may be a big portion, but we also have three or four more portions there available. Uh, really, really tasty, really good, pretty simple. I think we made it in 15 or 20 minutes. Um, so anyway, now that I can, now I'd like to see if there's any questions now that I've actually finished the dish, if anybody's around and wants to, to ask about anything. If there are any questions, go ahead and unmute yourself or submit them through the chat function. Hi, um, I need to know, I have a grill pan, and okay. what, at what temperature do you cook the chicken? Uh, and for about how long, when it's that size chicken, the half chicken? Well, that was a whole chicken, keep in mind. It's a whole oh. chicken that's been spatch top which is a funny yeah. word, but what it means is it's been butterflied and all open. Uh, the chicken that I cooked earlier today that I showed you the finished product was about a four pound chicken. I cooked it at 450 degrees and 
I would I cooked it for 45 minutes, and that was it. And it was perfectly well done, uh, perfectly done. Um, so high heat is the key in the oven, and uh, grill pan because they hold the heat so much better. So you're going to get a full heat if you have one. If you don't, uh, um, any type of baking dish will work as long as you elevate it a little bit with your veggies, uh, lemons and onions. You could even add garlic in there if you wanted. And a lot of times people will. I will even put some garlic in the oil that I rub all over it. Um, so hopefully that helps, or at least answers your question. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Eddie, did you have a question because you unmuted? No, I was just typing. <laughs> nothing, just nothing typing. important. I was just sharing <laughs> that I would eat it any day. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. The dish so looks are... delicious, John. I, I will say that it looks delicious. Yeah, and I mean, I know it's an Italian dish, so I want to, you know, I don't know if a lot of people eat that. Perhaps they do. Uh, but using, most people use collard greens or mustard greens, Swiss chard. Uh, I don't recommend spinach, um, even though I think it's okay to eat, depending on the potassium of the individual. But it's because you need so much spinach to go down. I mean, it's almost 10 to 1 uh, from fresh spinach down to enough to make a portion. Mm -hmm. that you would use. So we kind of avoid that if people, if people have to pass some issues. Um, yeah. So that one, that's that. That's where we are so far. We're doing okay? Yeah, we, it's 442. So I think Perfect. I'm good on time. We got time. We have lots of time. So the next dish I'm going to make is, uh, again, because we have changed the diet and because of the new standards, we can now expand the menu. And that's what a lot of people are doing. And they're doing with these plant-based products. Uh, but I wanted to bring one in that I have liked, but I wasn't able to eat while on dialysis because I was under the old system. And frankly, I never did because of it. And uh, it's hummus. And hummus is really, um, when I say hummus, I think most people are going to think of a creamy um, dish that is more dippable, you know, where you would run a pita through it or, uh, you know, so it, it feels almost liquidy or half and half. Um, but for about 20, well, for the 22 years in a restaurant that I worked and owned, um, I didn't make it like that. Uh, we made it very thick, and I always compared it to people. Uh, I said, it looks like a tuna salad consistency. And the reason was because it had so much more flexibility. Um, I'm going to make it thick. I'm going to add a lot of parsley to mine. I'm going to add a lot of lemon juice to mine. And it's going to have so many options. So, for instance, you, can, you will be able to spread it on a pita if that's how you like it, or a slice of bread or a bagel. You can make it into a sandwich just as easily. It can be a big like a clump on your side, on the side, and you can eat it just as it is without any starch. Um, and then from there, once we have it, we can do so many other things with flavors. You'll be able to add um, black olives if you're not, if it's not too much sodium for you, roasted red peppers, jalapenos. We've done all that. So you have this base hummus, and then you can just add on anything that's acceptable to the diet. And again, it's going to add a lot of flavor to a dish or to itself. It's going to be just so much flavor, and it'll be very helpful. So we're just going to make a quick hummus. Um, I'm going to have to plug this in because I think I forgot. Um, but there's another thing I'm going to want to talk about too. And, uh, you know, this is one of those questions I'm going to ask people to help me out on when we get there. Um, but we'll get there. So what I've done is I've made my own beans earlier today. I cooked my own chickpeas. Um, and again, uh, I've added flavors to this. So instead of that can of chickpeas with all that sodium or even the reduced level, I cooked my own. I added a little lemon juice in there. I used the Instant Pot. I added some onions and some garlic and a few other items that I know would be complementary to the dish we're making. Um, so we're going to start with that. I think I've got one of these. Um, it's got a whole bunch of flavors. Now, you can find a lot of different recipes for hummus. And again, they're probably going to come out a little more like that um, soupy, uh, creamy dish that you're going to find, say, uh, when you go out to eat and they serve it as a appetizer. Um, but for this one, I'm going to use a whole bunch of different flavors. We have the starter, which is uh, tahini, which is ground up sesame seeds. And that's it. There's nothing else in there. So that's great. Lots of black pepper, a little bit, a little bit of sodium. Now, this is my own little chili powder. I use cayenne, but I like to make my own from dried chilies because I have a spice grinder and I have it. And it just again, I get to control the flavors. Lots of fresh parsley, green onions, and I'm going to use 
lots of lemon and garlic. And that is really the whole dish. All you need to do from there is grind it up and get the right consistency. So, a lemon. We want the juice because that helps lighten it up along with the, uh, or, or makes the consistency better along with the tahini. There is a ton of nutrition in the peel of a lemon. Um, I've, I've done these little short videos around my website, and I really highlight this in one of them. There's a lot of flavor, there's a lot of nutrition, and they use the oil and not as much um, of the acid that comes from the juice. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my microplane and I'm going to get some of those oils right in there along with a little bit of the rind, the peel. Again, lots of nutrition. If you look it up, uh, and it's on the, uh, the little short videos on my website, I think it's about, just all about citrus. Um, but there's just, it's so good for you. It's good for kidney patients, of course, when I say good for you. And the flavor just jumps out. Of you. So I don't do much. I'm just going to use that much. This is my nun. And I've got a little bit of a, a little juicer here. But I'm going to just juice a couple of these lemons. Now, you could add more or less, depending on how, how much lemon you like. But keep in mind that the lemon juice is going to be one of the factors that helps make, us, make it less thick and gives it a better consistency. So for this taste, I'm just going to use two. Uh, you'll notice I didn't put all the chickpeas in there. And the reason, of course, is that in case I need to add some, I'll have them. Chickpeas can, are also a great dish if you want to roast them. I think our most, every RD I talk to is in the plant-based area now is using that as a side dish for people is to take, you know, your canned or better yet, your cooked chickpeas and then roast them with a little olive oil and it's a good crunchy snack. So here I'm just going to add a little pepper. Again, I will put up the specifics on these recipes. This is the tahini. Again, just ground up sesame seeds. Make sure you check your label on that. Most of them are, I haven't seen too many that have um, additional ingredients, but occasionally they do. Now here's a case where we're using that raw garlic. And for those that really like it, add more. I mean, we all know that garlic is not a bad item, especially fresh garlic for kidney patients. Uh, I myself don't like it as much as I mentioned, so I'm not gonna use as much. I give it a quick round because it's gonna get smashed up in there. Okay, I put my sodium. This is tamari. Tamari is a very high end soy sauce. It's much better. It is gonna have sodium. So that's why you don't use too much of it or you don't use too much salt as well. So you don't need it, but it adds a great flavor. That's just about a teaspoon and a half. Here's my parsley. I like the parsley. It's fresh. I, you can use dry, but when possible, use the fresh. It's not that expensive. And some green onions. Now, let's see if we get everything right here. So once we get started, it's going to take a little while. Uh, but you can see, now well, you probably can't, it's a little soon, how the consistency is getting. Okay, I will get a spoon for you and we'll show you. So when I talk about a consistency, you know, we're looking at something like that. Like it's not even falling off my spoon. So it kind of looks, it's very, very thick, but it's also very soft. So it, it, doesn't, um, it doesn't feel heavy and it has that lemon freshness. It has the, uh, the parsley, which goes really well, it has its own lemony flavor. I don't know if that looks good to you or not in there. But again, all I did was whip this up for a little bit. The green, it has all that fresh, fresh, um, uh, parsley in there. I did forget my cayenne or my fresh ground chilies, which is important. Again, this adds a ton of flavor and I would be very remiss if I forgot that. So I'm just going to add it. And again, if you want it thinner, add a little more lemon juice. Add a little more for you, not too much, um, because that has a lot of phosphorus in it. Um, and again, it, it, you can even make it spicier, you know, if you wanted to add more pepper. And we know that the spice is good. The capsaicin is really good for the body. Um, goes back you know, for average. Uh, I don't like to say that because sometimes it sounds like a folklore, but I guess the scientists are telling us that it's okay. And that is another extremely simple dish. Um, if we were to take it and plate it a little bit, you'll get an idea of what I mean when I say that it's just going to sit there on the plate. 
Uh, and you, this is even a little thin. Let's see if the camera switch works, right, John? Talking to the cam my camera guy. Um, so, you know, that's pretty thick for me. I would even add more chickpeas to make it thicker so that I can make a sandwich out of it. Again, I don't know if that picture is going to do it any justice, but um, it's really tasty. It's really delicious. And now that it's acceptable, I think it's a great way to add protein without adding meat um, to the dishes for those that are looking at these plant-based diets and how much they can help. Uh, so that's the food part. Now, before I get into the last little section, because this is the question part, I need some water. So with all the new plant-based diet stuff, I, um, I did some work with a, with a probiotic company that claims they are just for kidney patients. Um, so I, just because of that, I did try to learn as much as I could. Um, and uh, I wanted to know more about it, if it works. I'm not sure, but it seems very positive because I'm, I'm pro I promote the whole idea of the gut bacteria, and I think a lot of people do now. And if it can work, it can work. Um, but the reason with this new diet that uh, I was so confused about, and a lot of patients who started with the old and were transitioned now probably went through this. The new patients, I think, are probably, you tell them what to do, and they're going to hopefully do it, or to some degree. But the issue to me was uh, confusing, so I started to look it up, and I wanted to read more. And again, I know I don't want to be one of those, oh, I read it on the Internet guy, but I read the NCAIB studies. I read the NIH studies as best I can. It's documentable. It's documented, so I, and I really want to know your opinions as RGs on this. I'll give you the history. Forever, we have been trying to get more um, nutrients out of grains and cereals. Uh, even beans. And we know that there's a problem because the phosphorus, zinc, magnesium, I think it is, are locked into something by phylates. And it's those phylates that don't allow it to absorb into our system. So that's why it's such, why they're allowing us to eat all these is because of the absorption factor. And the absorption factor is made impossible by phylates that kind of control the nutrient uh, pool in there. But for, for farmers and even for people who work um, in countries with have high degrees of malnutrition, they've been trying to find a way to unlock all that. And they found it using uh, an enzyme. Again, I'm going to try to get through the science part for me. Uh, um, phylases. And phylases will unlock the phytates and then open up all the nutrients and make them available. So they do this for, again, people, they do it for both animal feed, trying to get it from cereals. Uh, they found that works there. They've done it with uh, microbiota, microbiota, I think that's a term, but microenzymes that they, they use to help unlock it. And again, for animal feed as well as for getting more out of cereals and grains. But when I was looking into the probiotics, what I found is the exact same enzymes they're using in probiotics are the exact same enzymes they use to unlock the phytates and allow the nutrition to come out. So they're putting phytases in there that would unlock it. And uh, those were, I'm going to look at it. I can see it on my board, Lactobacillus plantarum and Lactobacillus semilivorous, I think are the names. But I looked them up, and, and although not in the one kidney product that I saw, a lot of other pro, uh, prebiotic, probiotics had them. So it's kind of a question back to my RDs hey, is that going to be a problem? Is it something we ought to be looking at? If, you're if we're not going to recommend all these great new foods and all these high nutrient level foods that we don't think will absorb, but we're also taking probiotics with the same thing they use to unlock all those, is it going to be a problem? When I look at those probiotics, they all talk about how they use a, a, a casing that allows it to get through the stomach so that it doesn't deteriorate live bacteria that they're putting into your intestinal system. So we know it gets there, but what is it doing when it gets there to all of these newly high phosphorus and what we thought were low absorption foods? And that to me is something I think we could look into or find more out, more out about to make sure that we don't provide both and then have that uh, potential result. I don't know if it's an actual result, but it's a potential result. So that's kind of it. That's my, I'm looking at my clock. That's my 45 minutes to an hour of three cooking dishes. You know, why to, buy, why to buy air chilled chicken if you're a patient to eliminate the sodium and the inorganic phosphates? Um, 
cook it properly so you can use all of it to make it in stock. You can use it to make chicken salads. You can just eat it, uh, add the chicken to whatever you would. The greens and beans um, with that uh, broccoli rob and hummus. So that's about all I have for you. Is there, you any think, Carol? Is there any feedback for John on the question that he raised? Freddie is saying everything looks good. Anybody? She eat it any day. <laughs> <laughs> that came in. I love yeah, this is good for everybody. And I got that question about the, I, I'm not sure if I'm just telling you things you already know when it comes to those phytates and the phylaces. Um, but I think it's interesting, and I, I, I'm going to try to find some answers out myself by talking to more RGEs and see what we can find. I do know that every piece of research I read said, we're not really sure, but we want to do more research about it. Um, and a lot of it had to do with uh, the other Side. They want to increase the phosphorus availability in those foods rather than decrease it. So that's all I got for you, Carol. So I think this was great. We're going to send out an evaluation form to everyone that was on the call today asking for suggestions for future topics as well. Um, we will get this up on our YouTube channel also so we can share it. And John, feel free to link it on your website as well. I will, yes. Yeah. And um, we can certainly share the recipes with everyone as well, if that's okay. Yes, I would love that. Yes, please do, yeah. Um, but I, but I want to thank everyone for taking the time. You know, this is still a, a work in progress for us in this world of having to do things virtually. At some point, our plan is to have John live and sort of move him around our, our territory. Um, but for now, we'll, we'll be doing this online until we can safely do it in person again. So thank you, John, for sharing your expertise with us. Thank you to all of our RDs that, that joined today. And a special thank you to your helpers, John, because I know that you've got some folks. Scott and Jill, they're always my big helpers. Keep me in line, run the tech side. Thank um, you so much, John, it was excellent. Thank you, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Hope I can come back and do some more for you. Thank you very much. Okay, Thank everyone. You. Thanks for taking the time. Bye. Thanks, Carol. Thanks, John. And can I just Thank give you. one more plug for, for John before we hang up? If you check out um, Rochester oh. Women Online, he was featured in the men's edition of, of men really making a difference in the community. And um, John's helping a lot of kidney patients, so he was featured in that issue, in the most recent issue as well. So I'll There's other, um, also more information on my website, cookingforyourkidneys.com, yeah. which I try to share with all the RDs and patients free. And I just go there. There's lots of information, short videos. I kept, I kept referring to it, but I don't think I ever gave you the name. Um, okay. So it's okay. cookingforyourkidneys.com, same name as the book. Hey, John. Your website yeah. is linked on our website also. So. Hey, John. I happen to work with one of the authors for the... Um, was really big into um, this whole, um, you know, plant-based diet thing. Um, Jennifer Moore, I don't know if you've ever... Uh, I'm not familiar with her. Start your hands ever on her books. No, Jennifer I don't Moore. think so. I'd like to, though. Yeah, she she's awesome. And I actually work with her. You know, we both work for the same pharmaceutical company. And if you ever want to, you know, me to get you in touch with her for anything, just let me know. Please um, do. I, I love to talk to people, especially in the world that are pushing the limits on, uh, on patients. Yeah. She's, I, she's, you know, I have a transplant, but it was a, uh, it's not working great. So I'm still within the range of uh, CKD mm -hmm. and you have to be very careful. Yeah. If you ever want to talk to her, I mean, I can pass on, you can let Carol know or I, or reach out to me or I can reach out to you and share the information. Yeah. She's yeah, really definitely good. make that introduction ready. That would yeah, be because she is very right. good. I've actually seen on LinkedIn, Carol, where some of the CKD patients have said how it's really helped them bring their, you know, um, you know, help them with their GFR and help them with their creatinine levels. And, you know, I've seen a lot of stuff about it. Um, so I thought that since John's into, you know, the whole... Um, you know, cooking with um, mainly like low sodium, low this thing and plant-based. You know, she's an expert on the plant-based diet. So I right. thought that that's would be great. helpful, the collaboration. Yeah. Or, I think that would be great to make the introduction. So yep, I'm glad to do that. Thank you.
All right. Thank you, Carol. Right. Thanks, John. We'll look for the evaluation form, and I'll let everyone know when the uh, video has been posted. Sure. And I'll share it with you as well, John, so you can share it, and we'd love to Great. be able to share the recipes. Also. So the next one would be geared towards patients, did you say, Carol? Yeah, we're going to do every other month, one month for patients, one month for renal dietitians. But of course, anyone is welcome to join any of the sessions. Yes. Yeah, we do recipes. I would like to. I would like to see the patient one too, if that's okay. Yeah, absolutely. We, we open okay. them up to everyone. So. Okay. Thank you. All right. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Okay. All right. Thanks, Carol. All right. Have a good night. You too.